Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for loving us, those of us with brown hair, those of us with blonde hair, those of us with lighter skin and darker skin and bigger smiles and smaller smiles, expensive clothes, not expensive clothes, limps, no limps. And we pray, Father, that your love for us will fill us so that we can love like your Son loved us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess you get two sermons in one day. At 8 o'clock, I apologized to everybody for the bright light coming from the right side of the church over there. And, and apparently it's still true, there's still been three clergy sitting over there, three priests, you know. Father Aaron, Father Ian, and myself. And, and I, I teased folks this morning that uh, Roger put up the mission banner to block some of the light to preserve your eyes. What a joy it is for the people of God to be together. And yesterday, the people of God of our diocese gathered together to elect the eighth bishop of our diocese. And it was a wonderful day. The cathedral was filled with delegates and guests while the election took place. There was excitement in the air, none more excited than our own Bishop Russ as he watched his successor be elected. Our new bishop was elected on the second ballot, which is very fast. His name is Matthew Gunter. We've been praying for the election of our bishop. We've been praying for the candidates, and now we begin to pray for our new bishop by name. And I don't know his exact starting date, several months away. I do know his consecration will be in April. And as we pray for him, we get to reflect on an interesting parable given by Jesus, who is teaching his disciples to pray and to not give up. It is a story about a widow who is not getting justice, and she's bringing her case to a judge. She is a widow with little power, but more importantly, as I learned in Chicago growing up, didn't have any scratch, which means you can't get anywhere. And she was working hard to get somewhere, but she had no, no grease for the judge's palm. But she gets justice from the judge because she is persistent in bothering him. And so she becomes an icon for us for persistent prayer. Of course, there's an ending to this story that forces us to put our thinking caps on tightly because Jesus says that those of us who pray will quickly get justice from God. By experience, we know that quick for God and quick for us is not always exactly the same. Since we experience a wait quite often for life to be made right, will our faith last? Will we be persistent in our prayers or will we pray and not give up? I know that there are things that you pray for deep in your heart. I'm not talking about those prayers for good weather, that when they come true, you thank me. And I'm not talking about prayers for the results of football games. But there are things that you have prayed for for a long time, important things. And the wait is difficult. Christ is speaking to you, to us today. He's reminding us that God's love for us is immense. We do not pray to an uncaring judge who is only looking out for himself. We pray to the Father who loves us because we are his own. Keep praying. The answer will come. In the meantime, and isn't that where we live? in the meantime? And aren't we a people of the meantime? When the divine judge does return, and he will, all cases will be cleared. He will give justice to all. And for those for whom that causes fear, 
those who trust him will receive mercy as well. But justice will be given. And it has not happened yet. And in the meantime, we are encouraged to be faithful. We are encouraged to continue to pray, to be persistent. And as we are, I encourage you to add your prayers for our present bishop to your prayers for those things that are closest to your heart. Pray for our outgoing bishop, Bishop Jacobus. He gave us his final convention address yesterday. And as you can imagine, it was heartfelt. Uh, I'll be making some copies. They're not available now, but they will be. And in his address, he told us this. In his first address to the Diocese of Fond du Lac, the Right Reverend John Henry Hobart Brown, our first bishop, said the following when he was talking about a diocese. And that's all of our churches in the Diocese of Fond du Lac. Just as in the organization of an army, subdivisions to some extent is necessary, and self-government sometimes permissible and safe, so in the Church of God, the division of dioceses into parishes <coughs> excuse me, and communities is to a certain degree necessary and expedient. <coughs> but as everyone knows that no army can be strong and effective if each regiment and company does just what it pleases and without concert and agreement with other members of the army, so with the diocese, the parishes become weak and inoperative, just as they stand by themselves and are separated <clears throat> in sympathy and interest from other portions of the diocese. You know, in the old days, bishops spoke in long sentences. <laughs> and we then were trained to listen for a long time now it's a lot of work, isn't it? When I heard that, I really liked it. And it told me that our first bishop was very Anglican. We are less when we are on our own. Sometimes it's necessary, but we are less when we are on our own. And, as just, like, and just as Christ prayed for us to be one, as he and the Father are one, we are to be that here amongst ourselves at St. Thomas, and in our diocese. And as we receive a new bishop, what a wonderful time to remember how we are one together. It is clear that Bishop Jacobus' prayer for us in that address is that we be one with Christ and one with each other. And then later in his address he said, is the diocese a place where I feel comfortable stepping aside. And he continued, yes, it is. Yes, you are in a good place as long as you continue in what the Lord Jesus has called you to. If you remember, he said, what St. Teresa of Avila said in the 16th century, and you follow her advice, you and the diocese will be fine. She said, Christ has no body now on earth but yours. No hands but yours. No feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion is to look out to the world. Yours are the feet with which Christ is to go about doing good. That was true in the 16th century, he said, and is still true today. What the people in Northeast Wisconsin are going to know about Jesus will be through you and because of you. And then he ended with these heartfelt words. Thank you for the privilege and joy of serving as your bishop. I will continue to hold you in prayer. Just like our gospel lesson points us to do to be persistent and continue in prayer, and he is promising to faithfully pray for us, even as I ask you to hold Jerry and me in yours. 
He desires of us that oneness where we lift he and his wife up in prayer. Then he says, go now with God. Be not tempted to stay in the safety of known places. Move from where you are to where God points. Go now with God. Be not tempted to go in your own time when it suits, when it is sure, for now is God's time. Go now with God. Choose not to go alone. Go in the faith that there is no wilderness so vast, no way so confused, that God is not already there to show you the way. And he said, Amen. And I want us to ponder two postures of God. One going like this, God pointing us to go. But the other one like this. God inviting us to join him where he's at work. And our bishop has invited us to take seriously that call and to do it as one in Christ and with each other. And may we be persistent in prayer until the day that's completely true. Amen.